good. It's good. The potter's house. That's in Hebron, folks. That's where they came back and said that they were grasshoppers in the sight of the giants of the land. But they carried uh, grapes, and uh, it was all two men could do to carry one, one uh, cluster of grapes. And uh, that's where they have the potter's house. I'd like you tonight to turn with me, if you would, to the book of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 13 and verse number 14. First Samuel 13, 14. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. Father, bless your word. In thy holy name, amen. In this statement, the Lord hath sought a man after his own heart. Now, in the context, we know he's talking about David. And David was the uh, uh, king of Israel, eventually. And uh, his name in Hebrew is David, and it means beloved of God. It's like John in, in Greek, beloved of God. David's a very popular name among the Jewish people, very popular. And he is very, very, takes a very prominent place in your Bible. Now, uh, when you think about the heroes of the scripture, uh, to me, one would be Noah, and another one would be Job, and another one would be Esther, and another one would be some of these Old Testament prophets that, uh, like Daniel, for example, in the book of Daniel, and the things that he faced. But with David, you get a mixed bag, and that's what I'm going to try to deal with tonight. Uh, the Bible does not cover up his problems and it deals directly with them. And I think by the time I get through tonight, you'll appreciate the fact that David is in the Bible for an awful lot of people that need it. There are men right now that are sitting on death row that are murderers. They need to hear about David. There are people who have, uh, who have committed adultery and destroyed their home. They need to hear about David. There are people guilty of treachery which to me is one of the worst sins possible. Say, so what is treachery? Treachery is when you violate the trust that someone put in you. That's treachery. That's horrible. That's a horrible thing. And it's a true mark of your character, your treacherous character. You've heard it said before that talent and charisma and all the rest of that can get you to the top, and it can. But only character can keep you there. Amen. Amen. And I'm afraid an awful lot of Baptists sit on their eternal security and they don't think there's anything to do with the character that they develop and the Holy Spirit develops in them and the way they ought to live their lives. This is what James is in the Bible for. That's right. James is in there to teach us that we profess to be something, but if there's no works, no fruit, then it's just a dead profession. David's quite a character. He's a courageous man. He has all kinds of the things of character that, that people emulate. They like that. They, courage is, a, is, a, is quite a remarkable thing. Uh, I've told you about the, I don't know if I ever told you about the bloody angle in the Battle of the Wilderness in the Civil War. There's quite a few battles fought, obviously, in the Civil War. Uh, 600,000 uh, men, almost 600,000, died. And that was a huge percentage of the population of the country. But in any event, Robert E. Lee chose the wilderness to fight the battle because he was outnumbered. So therefore, he chose the battleground, figuring that it would give him a, a little bit of a strategic uh, help. But what's called the bloody angle there was fought in the, uh, in the wilderness. And it was a horrible place. The men were shooting each other dead. Horrible place. Now, this really happened. The one side would get up and they charge the other side. They charge with all their force and the other side would see the courage coming out of these men knowing that they're going into 
deadly fire that they die right on the spot and they cheered them. Isn't that something? They respect courage. You're going to see an awful lot of courage when you see what COVID-19 has done to the country and it's done to some of the churches. A lot of churches have just shut down completely, gone out of business. Do I dare say to you they weren't in business to begin with? He said, upon this rock I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. If I die in this pulpit, I couldn't die in a better place. Amen. Amen. I got that settled months ago. Got it settled months ago. I, settled, I said to the Lord, I can't live the life of a hypocrite. Either I believe what I preach and live what I preach, or I'm just no good at all. Amen. So we can learn some things from the life of David. But we know this. He was a murderer. He sent, he sent uh, Uriah to his death, carrying his own, his own uh, death certificate, if you please, to, and for Joab to pull away from him and leave him in the heat of the battle, and that's murder. And, but it's also treachery because of the way he treated Uriah the Hittite. Now, folks, remember this. He is not a Israeli or he's not a Jew. He's a Hittite. He's a pagan that had thrown his lot in with Israel. And so, treacherous, he looked at Uriah's wife and uh, Bathsheba. Bathsheba literally means the daughter of Sheba. Bath in Hebrew is daughter. And so she was the daughter of Sheba, Bathsheba. Beautiful woman, caught his eye. While his troops were away in war, he was up on top of, the, of his house. And uh, obviously, the way they built houses back in those days, you could look over to the next fellow's house, the next guy's house, and then you could spend a lot of time up there looking around the houses. Good night. Look at that. Boy, look over here. <laughs> and so, you know, you could, uh, better than the Internet, better than Facebook, <laughs> see everything that's going on. And he did. He saw a beautiful woman bathing. Now, of course, she didn't exercise a lot of, of uh, uh, you know, sense to be on top of her house bathing, knowing that somebody could see her. But anyway, he looked at her, lusted after her. And, uh, and, and since he was the king, he took her. And, uh, and she got pregnant. And you know the story. I'm sure you've read it many times that when it was told David she was pregnant, he said, well, I'll bring her husband back in, and we'll bring him from the battlefield, and we'll put... Uh, uh, we'll, we'll have him go into his wife, and therefore that'll cover up my sin. But the Bible says you can be sure your sin will find you out. It'll nag you, haunt you, follow you. It'll get you sooner or later. Sin will always win out, and the only thing that can defeat sin is the blood of Christ. That's the only thing. That's the only thing. Turning over a new leaf is not going to change your character. Your problem is your character. The problem is that you need something inside you changed. But in any event, David... David, uh, he did all of this, and it's hard to believe a man would do something like that who said in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 45, you come to me with a sword and a stave and all him, but see, I come to you in the name of the God of Israel. David said that. He meant it. He said, uh, he talked about the name of the Lord of hosts, and then the battle is the Lord's, he said. These are, these are, these are wonderful statements coming from the mouth of David. Then he also said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. David wrote that. And then he said, who am I, O Lord, and what is my house that you've chosen me, taken me from the sheep coat, to come and protect and defend thy people? A smart man said one time, he said that uh, David's outer life, what you see, what's recorded about the things that he did, are found in the book of Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles. But the inner life, what went on in his soul, is found in the Psalms. If you want to read about the conflict in David's soul, read the Psalms. Because he wrote over 70 of them, I think. He, he reveals the depth of his heart and the depth of his soul. And what it cost him and how horrible that, uh, that the, uh, the sin was. Here's what he said, Psalm 51. He said, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. Loving kindness in the Old Testament is grace, according to your grace. I'm not pleading justification. I'm not pleading place or, or ability or works. He said, I'm appealing to your grace. He said, 
Wash, have mercy according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me throughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. In verse 3, he says, I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Now he's beginning to talk like the man that the Lord said, I'll find one after mine own heart. Psalm 51, verse number 4. So what I'm saying to you tonight is, what makes David a man after God's own heart? What makes him a man after God's own heart? Because God rejected Saul. And you know, Saul had the priest of Nob put to death. What was it? How many of them there were? 50? 70? I forget how many exactly. All these men were put to death. And the reason they were is because David had been there and he ate of the showbread. And they had Goliath's sword. And so that connected them with, uh, with David. And so Saul and his jealous demonic rage had these priests put to death. And the Israelites wouldn't do it, so he called on Dueg the Edomite. And an Edomite is an enemy of Israel. Edom goes all the way back to Esau. Grudges were carried for a long time around there. We have to understand that. This Edomite had no problem at all in killing the, uh, in the priest of God. Whereas the Jew, the Israelite, the Hebrew, he didn't like that idea one bit. In verse number 6 of Psalm 51, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. In plainer words, folks, be true to yourself. If you've built up this fanciful, foolish, ignorant, stupid wall where you say, well, I really don't sin, you know, I mean, maybe a little, little bit, but no big deal. It's nothing God's concerned about. That's the situation we live in today. That's where we live. That's the culture. But the Bible says to search the heart. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. He said, who can know it? He said, I, the Lord, search the heart and try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. God is no respecter of persons. With David, he was no respecter of persons. With me, he'll be no respecter of persons. With you, no respecter of persons. So there's a lot of sadness in the life of David, but he did get right with God. That had a lot to do with David being a man after God's own heart. He knew how to get right with God. That's important. You notice that he didn't do anything that was really what you'd call religious. He just opened up in his soul. His soul. He opened up in his soul. Because he carried a burden, folks. Uriah's face, no doubt, was before him. No doubt in my mind. It ate him alive. And he had to do something about it. And so he says in verse 11, Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. The Old Testament saint prayed prayers like that because he wasn't sealed with the Holy Ghost. The reason he wasn't sealed with the Holy Spirit is because he wasn't born again. Nobody could be born again until the new covenant was ratified. That's a way to say brought into legality. It became powerful. It became efficacious. It had strength. It became the law. When Christ died on the cross, he instituted the new covenant. This is the new covenant of my blood, he said. The blood was shed at the cross. And when that happened, every one of us in here tonight, we received the benefit of that blood sacrifice on the cross. We didn't give it. God gave it. All he asked is for us to accept it. And it's called a vicarious death. And that's just a big word that simply means he died in our stead. That's what that means. Vicarious suffering means he's suffering for another. So the vicarious death of Christ means that I should have died. I should have. I ought to be in hell right now. I worked hard at it for 27 years. I did. I wanted to make sure I was qualified to go to hell. I was qualified. <laughs> I did my part. No doubt about it. I don't try to cover up and hide anything. If all I was was what I, what I was before I, God saved my soul, I'd have business up here tonight preaching to you or saying anything for the Lord, but I'm not what I used to be. Praise God. And that's why I can look at any man. I don't care who you are, where you came from, what you've done, how much money you got in your pocket, what all you've done. I can look at you and say, look, he forgave David, he forgave me, and he can forgive you. And that's blessed hope, blessed hope. The fellow on the radio yesterday talking about the sovereignty of God, the election, the sovereignty of God, the elect, the elect, the elect, the elect. 
And I thought to myself, well, what if I called him up and said, am I one of the elect? And see what he says to answer that question. Because if you're not one of the elect, according to these people, you were born to go to, let's say it, not born, in eternity past, before the first human being was ever made, God ordained you to burn in hell. What do you think about that? Now, I'm not ruling out election. There is election in the New Testament, but not the way they warped it. Amen. For whosoever will, let him come. So you're sitting in here tonight, or you're watching this thing on television, you've some, done some heinous things. Heinous. They did a thing on Fox, just they're doing it right now on Fox Nation about the, uh, uh, I was about 30 years ago, about all these kids that had been brainwashed into believing that they had been sexually assaulted and they were in some kind of a daycare thing. I forget the name that's attached to that, but in any event, a bunch of parents wound up being blamed. And all of this because one person who was a witch hunter entered into this thing and he, like a sledgehammer, he just began to force confessions from children and bring parents into judgment before them. And some of those parents spent as much as two or three years locked up in prison. But come to find out, the kids later on confessed that they'd been forced into it, they'd been brainwashed, and it wasn't true. It never happened. It never happened. Yet, they were convicted, and they went to jail. Story doesn't end there, though. The kids that were brainwashed, that testified against their parents, some of them practically lost their mind. Why? Because they had turned against the one that loved them more than anybody else in the world. They turned against their own parents. And because the government got involved. Let me tell you something. The government doesn't own your children. Render to Caesar that which is Caesar's. You don't own them either. <laughs> the Lord owns them. And he loans them to you because the Bible says they're the heritage of the Lord. Now, I've never heard anybody really argue with me about the Lord owning their children. Well, if the Lord owns them, that's okay. It is okay because he'll do what's right for them, not Caesar. Because they're taking kids now and they're, and, they're, and they're brainwashing them. But in any event, the point I'm trying to make is this, and this is an important point. They couldn't live with it. As they got older, they, they, all kinds of problems, all kinds of problems developed among these kids as they began to grow up because they had turned on their own parents. They turned on the ones that loved them the most. You know, Hitler did that over there in Germany. He had, he had kids testify against their own parents. He had, he had eyes. He had eyes watching everywhere, watching every movement they made. That's a kind of wicked, godless thing that went on. That's the kind of thing. So he said, deliver me from blood guiltness. See there? There's the blood guiltness. He knew the blood. Have you ever notice how that when it always comes down to the bottom line of what you've done, blood's involved. You ever notice that? Blood. The first covering for sin, the first covering for sin that God had anything to do with, blood was shed. They sewed fig leaves together. That's an indication of man's attempt to cover his own nakedness. In other words, that's religion. A lot of things can be fig leaves, but the only way that they could be covered was by the blood, the blood of a lamb. And he made skin, coats of skins, and he covered them. When David faced Goliath, though, you begin to see his character some of the sterling points of his character where God says, I'm going to choose a man after mine own heart. He didn't say, I'm going to choose a perfect man. He didn't say that. He didn't say that. And I'm going to show you right here some of the things about David that warms you to his heart. He didn't choose a perfect man. He said, but I'm going to pick one after my own heart. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 34, And David said to Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. Okay? He said, I went out after him. Now, when's the last time you wrestled with a bear? And when we're talking about lions, we're talking about real lions. Because real lions, like African lions, at one time lived in the Holy Land. Yes, sir. 
So, I mean, when's the last time you wrestled with a lion? That took courage, folks. That took raw courage. And look what he says. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. He took the lamb right out of the mouth. I thought, man, that's a beautiful picture of Christ because that's what he does for some. Some get so far, it's just about over, and he'll take you right out of the mouth of the lion. He can rescue you at any point in your life. You may have given up on yourself. Everybody else has given up on you. You've tried everything you can try, and then you say, there's no, say, there's no hope for me. I'm finished. No, there's always hope for the blood of Christ can reach into the darkness and pull you out. And so when he arose against me, he said, I caught him with the beard and smote him and slew him. He said, thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. There we go. David had a spiritual discernment. He understood what this was about. He knew this wasn't about a, a, a battle between two opposing armies. No, 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 no. Notice what he did with it. It's not this army uh, outmaneuvering or defeating another army. No, he pulled God right into it. And he said, God's on our side. Next time we go to war, well, I'd like to have the Lord on my side, wouldn't you? That makes all the difference in the world. So David had courage. But he also knew what it was to be forgiven. That made him after God's own heart. God forgives you and then you forgive yourself. Whether other people forgive you depends upon their spiritual maturity. You're going to find some, uh, you're going to find some uh, uh, Pharisees in every church you go to that delight in beating you down and dragging your past up before you constantly and wearing you out with it. Let me tell you who that person is. That person is totally unstable in their own life, and they don't, they've never been really forgiven for anything. Because why would you deny someone else that? Have you ever been forgiven? That's the most blessed thing in the world. Hallelujah to God. The burden's lifted. You know you're clean. And all of a sudden you think, man, that all I had to do tell to confess and God cleaned me up. Why would you want to deny somebody that? Because there are people right now working their hardest to try to be forgiven. And work will not do it. Take him at his word. Take him at his word. But repentance, he said, against thee and thee only have I sinned. God be merciful to me, a sinner. And God wants to be merciful to sinners. He's the friend of sinners. That made David after God's own heart. Courage made David after God's own heart. And here's a remarkable thing over here. Turn to 2 Samuel 24. This is one of those things that kind of you can kind of look past it if you're not careful. 2 Samuel chapter number 24. Second Samuel 24. And verse 11. Second Samuel 24, verse 11. For when David was up in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say unto David, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So David came, so Gad came to David told him and said unto him, here they are, here are the three things. These are the choices that God gave to David to set the record clean. Here they are. Shall seven years of famine come unto thee in the land? Or wilt thou flee three months before thine enemies while they pursue thee? Or number three, look at this one. Or that there be three days pestilence in thy land now advise and see what answer I shall return to him that sent me. Now look, how the, look at this. Verse 14, David said to Gad, I'm in a great strait. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, and his mercies are great. And let me not fall into the hand of man. You don't need to go any further than that. In other words, my life is in his hands. It's in his hands, folks. My life is in his hands. And if God's going to deal with me over my life, if there's going to be any chastening, 
then he said, I'm going to trust God, and he'll do it, and he'll be fair about it, and he'll do it as a father, and he'll do it for my good, and I'll trust him. I won't trust men. I'll trust God. And that's, uh, that's pretty good, don't you think? Now, have you ever heard of Absalom? How many of you have heard about Absalom? You know who he was. Okay. Abba Shalom. That's his name. Abba Shalom. Father Shalom Peace. Father of Peace. He was anything but that. But Absalom was the son of David. He had long hair. He was a, he was a charismatic. Oh, boy, was he ever. He knew how to talk to people. He knew how to win them over. He would have made a good politician, believe me. Oh, yeah, Absalom was a good politician. He put every Democrat and Republican in the country to shame. He knew how to get the votes. And you know what he did? He turned the people against David, turned them against David, and he wound up usurping the seat of David as the king of Israel. David didn't want to kill his son. He loved his son. So what did he do? He left Jerusalem. He went across the Kidron Valley. All right. He wept, the Bible says, as he went. And so did all the people with him. They wept. Can you imagine how brokenhearted they were? The Bible says that Absalom took the concubines of David, took them up on a housetop where everybody could see, and uh, violated them, raped them before the world. He, what he was trying to say was, my connection to my father is broken, irretrievably. It's over. And so, of course, he showed the people that you support me and you've turned on David and there'll be no David coming back. It's over with. So David crosses the Kidron. The prophet Nathan had already told him when he confronted him over Bathsheba and over the death of Uriah. The prophet had already told him. He said, the sword will not depart from your house, David. You're going to have to live with this for the rest of your life. And it did. That's an entirely different message about the sword in the house of David. What a thing it was. But here's what I want to call your attention to. As they crossed over the Jordan, uh, not the Jordan, but the Kidron, the Kidron Valley goes right by the Gethsemane, and it goes by the Mount of Olives, and, and it carries you out of Jerusalem through the Eastern Gate. And so he's, he's leaving Jerusalem and weeping, and his son's broken his heart. And we get that, and we turn over here, if you will, with me. To 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 5. Now, I'll close with this tonight, but I want you to see this is a powerful, powerful thing. 2 Samuel chapter 16 and verse number 5. He's fleeing his son Absalom. 2 Samuel 16, verse 5. And when King David came to Bahurim, behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul. Now, that gets into a thing where these house of Saul, they hated David because of some of the things that happened, whose name was Shammai, the son of Gera. He came forth and cursed still as he came, cursing. He cast stones at David, and in all the servants of the king David, and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And thus said Shammai when he cursed. This is a soldier. This is a hardened battle soldier, battle-hardened soldier. Shammai, when he cursed, came out, came out, thou bloody man, he said, and thou man of Belial, and not him, but he shows up in a minute. This is the one who does the cursing, Shammai. Verse 8, the Lord hath returned unto thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom, thy son. And behold, thou art taken in thy mischief. Behold, thou art a bloody man. Then said Abishai, here's your soldier. Abishai, the son of Zariah, unto the king. Abishai was a nephew of David, so he was part of his family. The Bible says in verse 9, Then said Abishai, the son of Zariah, unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. That's not hard to understand, is it? I'll decapitate him. I'll hold that head up right here, and I'll show everybody around here what it, how it pays to curse the king. Now, David's response is the part, don't miss this. This is what's important about it. David knew the sword would not depart from his house. Remember, David is a man after God's own heart. Remember that David, he, after he had sinned, 
he began to write these psalms that you read and rejoice in and sing. It's after all that mess of murder and treachery. Look how he had it. Look what he did. Verse 10. And the king said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah? So let him curse. Because the Lord hath said unto him, Curse David. Who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? David said to Abishai, To all his servants, Behold, my son, which came forth of my bowels, seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? In other words, if Absalom has a right to come after his father's life, I mean, good night. If he does, look at this one. He has every right in the world to try to put me to death. And here's what he said in verse 11. Let him alone and let him curse, for the Lord hath bidden him. It may be the Lord will look on mine affliction and that the Lord will requite me good for his cursing this day. He put, his hand, he put himself in the hands of God. That's what he did. Curse on, he said. Curse on. I deserve it. I deserve it. Instead of feeling sorry for himself, crawling up in a hole somewhere and blaming everybody else for his problems, David took it like a man and said, go ahead and curse. And you can't curse unless God's with you anyway. You can't curse that which God has blessed. And he had been anointed twice as the king. But he cursed. And David said, it's okay. It's okay. God knows all about it. It's going to be okay. Now, maybe you've been, uh, got, you know, maybe, maybe you got out of the will of God. You got out here and got in some junk you shouldn't have been in. And Satan now is wearing you out with it. That's what he does. He'll tempt you into it, and then once you get into it, he'll beat you to death with what you've done. Oh, yeah, he'll wear you out. The Bible said he's the accuser of the brethren. He'll wear you out. So what do you do, fight the devil? No, you don't fight the devil. No, the Bible said resist the devil. You don't flee from him. You can't outrun him. You can't fight him. So what do you do with him? Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. The same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. It's in that context. The rain comes on the just and the unjust. The sun shines upon both. We both take bodies of our loved ones out to the graveyard. We all go, to, both of us go into the, into the hospitals at time and suffer. Both of us go through the tribulation trials and problems of this world. But here's the difference. Thanks unto God tonight, I don't go alone. And also, it doesn't just happen to me out of chance. No, no, no. Anything that happens to me it's just like David said, God knows all about it. God knows all about it. He knows all about it. We'll leave it with the hands of the Lord. I've done wrong, and I've confessed it, and I'm going to live for God, and God knows. That's a man after God's own heart. And if you're like that tonight, you're after his heart. Now notice, he didn't say, I'm going to seek out a man in perfection. He said, I want to seek out one after mine own heart. And the character of these people in the Old Testament was a remarkable thing, the difference in some of them, the difference. David was on both sides, both sides. Thanks be unto God for the forgiven David who then sings the Psalms and writes the Psalms and says, Lord, my life is in your hand. Father, bless your word. Thank you that we have an opportunity to come to the house of the Lord. I bless and praise thee as long as I've got the life of my body. You've been good to me. You've been good to me. You've been good to me. Lord, take what's been said tonight. Help somebody with it. I'm not here to beat people up. I'm here to help them. I'm here to speak for the Lord. There may be somebody in this house that needed to hear this tonight. And they, they need to talk to you. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. There may be somebody watching this thing over the internet and they need to talk to you. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. And maybe they'd like to come down here tonight and pray. We all get together and we'll pray here in this altar. That's a good thing. We've got a lot of things to pray about, Lord. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you like to come and pray with me? And if you have, uh, if you have something special on your heart, come on down here and pray about it. And we'll talk about your request here in a minute. But we can come down here and we can pray and we can talk to the Lord. Y'all come on down.